at, at their leisure. There we go, the recording is, is up and running. Um, so as I said, my name's David Blackadder Weinstein, I'm a Strategic Communications Director at Turley, uh, and working with colleagues at Ferris and McBain's this evening uh, to present our consultation to you. Uh, many people who we met in Leominster this Saturday just gone when we were at the farmer's market conducting a physical consultation. Uh, also people that we've seen the, uh, the media release that was put out by Herefordshire Council last week um, and coming across the, the consultation on social media and of course by, by word of mouth as well. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, as you can see on the screen, we're, we're sharing our, our presentation content and we've kept the content exactly the same as that content which is available on the uh, Herefordshire Council website. And so you know, hopefully people will start to become much more familiar with this content and all of it is aligned to, to the questions in the questionnaire that you can also find on that website. And that's why it's so important that we get uh, everybody familiar with this content so that the answers that you can give us via that questionnaire are really useful for the team uh, while they're putting together their recommendations for both members to town council and Herefordshire Council, and you'll, you'll hear us repeat that message, I think, uh, many times over the next hour or so. So I've got about 20 minutes to, uh, to present, uh, and the team will introduce themselves in a moment, uh, and then we can take some questions, um, not only at the end, actually, but throughout. So many of you may be familiar with uh, this webinar platform. Uh, many of us have been using it now over the last couple of years through the pandemic. So if you've got a Q&A function there. If you'd like to ask us a question, please click the check the Q&A, type your question in, we'll see it pop up and, and I'll make sure that we put it to the project team. Um, the chat function is reserved more for any technical, technical issues you may be having. So if you've got an issue with your sound um, or you can't see us uh, at any moment, please do pop something in the chat. My colleague Alice will, will try and fix it for you. Normally that advice tends to be turn it off and turn it on again as is such the way with 21st century technology, but we'll, we'll do what we can. And again, please be reassured if you do have a complete system failure for some reason or other, this is being recorded uh, and it will go up on the website afterwards. So at that point, um, I've introduced myself, um, I've introduced Alice, uh, so the rest of the team. Um, Phil, perhaps you'd like to, to introduce yourself. Okay, I'm Phil Diamond, Associate at McBain's. Um, we are pulled together a, a, a team um, of number of uh, uh, consultants to uh, work on this project. Um, I will, McBain's are project managers and also um, we'll be looking at uh, services, particularly electrical services in and around the square, uh, maybe some lighting as well, uh, and also looking after the cost, managing the costs on the project. Um, I would also make a mention for Link Engineering who aren't represented on the panel. Uh, they are highways experts, uh, construction of the, the roads, pavements, um, that are required to uh, meet highways authority requirements, also doing um, pedestrian traffic surveys, street lighting and such like, and road drainage as well. Uh, and then the final member of the team are Aries, the landscape architects, and I'll hand over to James and Jess uh, to introduce themselves either immediately or when they do the presentation. Go for it, James, Jess. Thank you both. Uh, so my name is James Gardner. I'm Associate Director at Ares Landscape Architects. Uh, we are the lead designers on the project um, and we're, as the name suggests, landscape architects. So we specialise in public realm improvements, uh, landscape design, and we're running the project through our Cheltenham office, which is nice and local. So we benefit from that. And I'll let Jessica introduce herself as well. Hi everybody, yeah, my name is Jess and I'm working with James on the design side of things um, with the wider project team. Thanks Jess. So just as a reminder for everybody and again I'm sure you've been able to see this information uh, online which is how you uh, joined up for this webinar in the first place. But the reason we're here this evening is because the High Streets Heritage Action Zone programme is a £95 million government funded scheme delivered by Historic England working in partnership with local authorities. And the objective is to kickstart regeneration of selected high streets across England to promote economic, social and cultural recovery and to unlock their potential for future generations. And unfortunately, Lemster's High Street has been selected as one of those um, and won this opportunity for funding. And, and James and Jess will talk a little bit about what that economic, social and cultural recovery means specifically for Lemster. Um, so it's a heritage-led program. We need to create a more attractive, engaging and vibrant town centre of Lemster 
celebrating culture and history and boosting tourism and economic growth as a result. And, and the number uh, is about two million pounds that's behind the, the funding specifically for Leinster for this High Streets Heritage Action Zone. So at that point, um, we'll talk about the, the success criteria and what this project is looking to achieve for Leinster uh, and James, it's, it's areas that are behind the, the design of these success criteria and they've been developed in partnership with uh, both Herefordshire and Leinster, haven't they? It is, yes. And I think the prompt there, project aim. So when we started on the project as a design team, Leominster and Herefordshire had a very, um, very well defined project aim and ultimate and and it is linked to the funding as david said you know the funding is coming from historic england so the the aim is to revitalize the historic retail and town center so largely a lot of the work that we're doing is you know that is the the core the key principle um and as through the stakeholder engagement that we've had through Leominster and Herefordshire so far, we've developed these project aims um, and success criteria, which largely allow us to, throughout the project timeline, revisit, see how things are developing. Um, and they bring into these, um, these design ideas, these toolkits. So, you know, we are looking to establish refreshed, clean, um, a maintainable space. We talked a lot on Saturday, David, didn't we, to, to members of the public about what do we do? We've stood there in Corn Square, with asked the question, what are you doing? And ultimately it is creating a space using our expertise of the whole design team and through Lemonster and Hereford, um, creating a space that has the flexibility, the future provision for Lemonster to do what they need to do and to allow them to thrive. Um, you know, we put there the flex flexible people centered um, town centre. So it's allowing all the uh, the existing and future events like the farmers market and also reanimating the town centre. We were asked a lot of questions and a few times, what does reanimate? What does these active frontages mean? And it's all about allowing the businesses to or, or effectively spill out into the streetscape. There's a huge um, heritage and existing features there as they are hidden and we're we're opening that we're giving that flexibility um and ultimately creating that platform that allows the community to to take future ownership and and develop it as as it needs to ultimately and james what we mean by that future ownership again that's something that we've been asked about locally as well is is i think you've alluded to it there but creating a space that then the people of lemster the town council can take on and, and use as, as they will their own by their own choice their own free will if you like rather than being dictated to as this space can only be used for this one thing or this this one other thing and we'll get on to a bit more detail particularly when thinking about the possibilities for, for corn square uh, and, and on these success criteria um there is one of the questions in the um, in the questionnaire that ask you how do you feel about these do these make do these make sense to you and that's because it is important that we all understand what what this project is trying to achieve and, and understand how well that is signed up to at the very beginning of the project as opposed to only at the end so uh, james at that point I'll... thank you and yeah to take that point for further you know the um the areas that you're most proud of and and we've had significant consultation we've listened and we understand um these areas are um you know everyone at Lemster is proud of and i think it links back to the question about community ownership of you know some of the some of the areas that we picked out when we first visited Lemster that really struck us were these small alleyways and streets that maybe haven't had huge funds of a huge amounts of money spent but are actually incredibly welcoming and vibrant spaces because they have the local residents taking ownership and whether that's small areas of bunting or planting or just keeping them clean and tidy um, and then obviously there's the huge amount of heritage um, that Lemonster has to offer. Again it's, these are things James are those things that you you really felt you liked didn't you when you very, very first came to to Lemster. Absolutely. Um, so we want to know which bits of these are, the, are those bits that you want everybody to, to accentuate or we can accentuate through the work that we're doing. So what's driving the work? These are these are the project principles, aren't they? They are, and I think it it they these are the principles as landscape architects, as highway engineers, these are and and the rest of the design team, these are the principles that we uh, know through the, the professions that you know under 
underpin those elements. So the environmental um, pieces, everyone's aware of the climate emergency and what we can do. And these are the environmental elements are actually quite tangible in what we can bring into developing the space. The key is, is to bring those into the design where they don't limit future flexibility. Um, I think the economical benefits are largely, you know, you can see what those are and they will come with uh, the successful development of these spaces. Um, and I think things kind of like attracting, you know, we've spoken to people about how important it would be to Lemster to have a hotel and, and it's the, those longer term multiplier effects that will come through the success of a, of a project like this that then help them to be seen in a different light by various uh, investors or, or other stakeholders and, and you know, a hotelier could be a future investor that, that decides to, to um, make a jump with Lemster as a result of a project like this who may not otherwise have done so and that, that's a good example of an economic one. Absolutely. And, and even the smaller areas where the, the, the farmers market they were at, they actually, you know, we understand from a lot of the local businesses that they see much larger footfall on those market days. And it's if we can benefit the space that allows the farmers market and other events to to thrive and expand, it draws more people in. So it's small steps as well as those big steps that you talk about. And I think the cultural element is you know, that largely we see that already existing in Leominster um, and it's, it's the history, it's, it's everything that's unique. Um, you just have to look at the, the, um, the Leominster events to see that culture. It's there. We just need to give better space for it to, to expand and continue, I think. And on the social side, we've we talked a lot about the people. You know, these are the people that we were meeting on Saturday, the people that are joining us um, this evening uh, and that will be telling other people in Leominster to, to come and, and click on the consultation website and to, to watch the video, to, to watch the other video content we create, watch this recording uh, and to answer the questionnaire. And it's about being able to, to engage with, with you, you know, people who know Leominster better than us. You are the Leominster experts about what you think is is best for the town and the town centre, so that the recommendations that the project team makes to, to the town council and to Herefordshire Council are as, as far grounded in um, what people want at a local level as possible. And, and I, I spoke to uh, to one lady on, on Saturday who, who has three teenage children who currently all live with her in Leominster and, and, and they don't necessarily think the world of the town at the moment and, and might be thinking about, about leaving when, when they grow up. And one of the things that they can really do from a social aspect of a project like this is make Lemster more appealing for, for young people to stay in uh, for longer uh, into adulthood rather than, than necessarily moving elsewhere as they grow up because again that will have really important social benefits for the town as a whole. Um, and on the historical side James, Jess, you, you, also, you already mentioned the, the history from, from a cultural perspective but there really are some amazing buildings in the town aren't there? There really are and something that we would really like to do is bring out those slightly more hidden gems for example, the, the alleyways and the entrances to the, the smaller ginnels and alleyways up the high street. And there's a lot of smaller artifacts and features that you discover as you walk through the town and you get to know it a bit more. Um, and we just want to bring those to the fore. So that actually leads us on quite nicely to our placemaking themes, which really are the next st stage on from those principles. So it's a bit more of the, well, how do we how do we achieve those things? And you can read and digest in your own time, but um, from an environmental perspective, we'll be focusing on creating cleaner and safer streets. So that's through the right um, design and material choices. And um, it comes down to things like improving the furniture so it's easier to keep the streets clean and maintain. Um, in terms of better connectivity and access to people, it's partly um, a social principle, but also um, important for uh, mobility in general, movement throughout the town. Um, and again, going back to those alleyways, um, as an example, we'll be uh, looking to signpost those and open those up and improve those connections through the town. Um, and in terms of supporting local biz businesses and shops, it comes back to economic principle, really, um, whereby we'll be improving the frontages um, from a physical sense in front of those uh, those premises but ultimately improving the general streetscape to encourage that inward investment and encourage um, some uh, tenants back into the vacant units and I think as David said that has a knock-on impact um, in encouraging uh, future inward investment 
heritage revealed and restored and celebrated uh, speaks to my um, earlier point about the history really and just revealing those those hidden features and artifacts uh, the flexible culture and event spaces is something that uh, we feel quite strongly is is um, important and ultimately very achievable for Lemmister. So you have a great uh, festival calendar already, um, a really unique offer there, and it's just allowing those spaces to thrive and grow and expand. And in terms of high quality streetscapes and creating public spaces, uh, again, it's through very sensitive material choices that are quality and durable, easy to maintain ultimately and prioritizing people over cars to create a more pedestrian friendly environment those place making themes just one of the things that um i felt like some of the people we spoke to on saturday james really really embraced and started thinking about well okay well how about can you enable us to create some covered space for example um, in corn square so that we can through the winter months compete better against other market towns in the surrounding area um, so that we can continue to have usable public spaces and public markets even when when the weather is less less clement and again you know that does create public spaces that currently aren't there do live in england whether we like it or not and and the weather isn't wonderful all year round um the opportunity that's offered by covered market space again one of the uh, covered market space one of the things which was brought up to us was talking to us about we, we were there it was a lovely day on saturday beautiful sunshine you know it's great the way it was but um, a lady telling us about how sometimes when it's raining just where the awnings stop, you know, send the trip right down the back of her neck and make buying anything <laughs> um, really quite an unappealing prospect. And that's one of those things that you just don't know about unless you speak to people or, or get get feedback from people. Um, and the opportunity is to do that through the questionnaire. So a really good example of, of where these placemaking themes kicked off a, a useful conversation, which um, James, Jess, Aries and the team can take into account with regards uh, some of the recommendations you make and thinking that you have about the potential uses of Corn Square. So I mentioned a problem there that, that isn't on these pictures, you know, the dripping off the awnings down the back of the neck, but there are some more obvious problems that you've been able to capture, uh, James and Jess, on your visits to um, visits to Lemster Town Centre through the first half of this year. There is, and and I think this is, uh, you know, when we when we first visited site, there were there were things that are more obvious than others, uh, the pedestrian experience, you know, the the narrow footpaths, the undulating carriageway and footpaths as well and and the, the the steps you know we were at the market on saturday weren't we for three hours and i think uh, unfortunately there was i i counted at least half a dozen trips and stumbles off the curbs and and these are these are things that we we can very easily design out by re revitalizing the space accessibility is always a very key um item whether it's physical barriers to accessibility or failings in paving that create um, dips and undulation that gets full of water. We've also had all the consultation people have told us right from the outset, when it's heavily raining, you don't walk down High Street because it's a, a, a wash of surface water. And it's it's those local instances that we do we better understand the scenario there um wayfinding and storytelling is in another thing david i remember when we first visited site it was there is a significant amount of wayfinding but does it create that that wow that interest to take you to those spaces that we know or we know now more than what we did when we first started that you know the history the context the, the culture that we know is there and we spoke um, to a gentleman on Saturday, James, didn't we, about the, the Herefordshire Trail. He said, you know, this, this comes right through the middle of the town, but you wouldn't you wouldn't know it and you can't see it. Really? It's not it's not tangible. Um, and, and again, that's something immediately for us to to consider. And uh, you know, we call this wayfinding and storytelling. That's the that's the technical speak. Wayfinding is the technical word in, in the architectural world, the placemaking world. But it basically means signs, doesn't it? And it's um, not be a sign. There are other ways of wayfinding. but. People did come up to us and offer straight away. You know, I don't like the signs; they're a bit shabby, they're out of date, they, they're not they're not kept as, as clean as we'd like, or they don't sh share the right information. So that was something that was coming from people to us, and without even being prompted. Absolutely, and and activity in spaces is a is a really key one. One of the first things that that jumped in my mind while I first visited Lemster is actually how well um, occupied. The the premises are and I think we see it a lot doing lots of projects throughout the country in various market towns or larger cities is the vacant space and, and Lemster has a very well, I believe it's got a very good um, 
kind of presence from small independent businesses as well as some of the larger ones. But the activity of those spaces outside some of the shops, just mentioned previously, the physical entrance spaces and that activity of do we we can allow businesses to move out into the public space and and everything that COVID's taught us is that people want outdoor space and Lemonster benefits from these great spaces that are currently dominated by cars and that you know as David said that is a big thing one of the big topics that came up at certainly at, yes uh, Saturday's farmers market. There will be change won't there? We, this, we still find ourselves going through this, this, this post-COVID period that we're in and there will be shops that change ownership change operation uh, and, and there are some empty units in the town as well and, and again that's one of the, the economic benefits that um, we feel we can bring through the success of this this project is to make sure that those that those are minimized and you've got new um, exciting businesses coming in where where others are are, are potentially leaving absolutely so we, we talk about the where for a moment and, and we have spoken a great deal about Corn Square, James, Jess, and I think that you know, probably from our, our experience on Saturday, that's always going to be the case because you are standing in Corn Square and you're surrounded by, by it as, a, as an amphitheatre to, to host the discussions that you're having. But there is more to this project than, than just Corn Square, isn't there? You've got uh, High Street, Broad Street, West Street as well. James, Jess, can you talk to us a little bit about some of your thinking around the opportunities for those areas as well? Absolutely. And and I think the, as you said, Corn Square is the key space. Um, there is elements of funding that is linked to the spaces. So there is a pot of money for Corn Square and there's a pot of money for the wider high street, which re really is, is the historic um, market town. But the further we get into the detail of the project and understanding the space, it's clear to us that actually you can't just limit the works to small spaces there is benefit and opportunity in extending the extensive works now how far that goes and the the interventions that happen in those spaces is very much what we're at the point now is that we want to discuss these and hear everyone's views on what you would like to see in some of those spaces because there may be bits that we have overlooked not not, not overlooked but we haven't seen yet um, we've got in um, significant surveys of the physical surveys and um, surveys of circulation and access that under underpin the work that we're doing, but we understand there's there's varying scope really. Um, and so one of the reasons we wanted to include this map, and we appreciate it's quite conceptual in its nature, but we wanted to show that everything we're doing, we're considering the wider context around those specific. Um, project sites and extensive work, we're always thinking about how they connect to the other sort of major landmarks and um, attractions and cultural hubs, if you like, of Leominster. Um, and another thing to say about uh, well, Broad Street to the north, going back to um, David and James's earlier point around uh, the spill out spaces in front of businesses, if you take Broad Street, for example, um, it's incredibly wide street, uh, would have once upon a time have been fully pedestrianised, has since become essentially uh, reclaimed by, uh, by vehicles and there's parking on both sides. Uh, now that's an example which with uh, a bit of a, a change to the, to the parking system there and reducing the amount of parking, for example, and allowing a bit more spill out space in front of some of the cafes on Broad Street and some of the, um, the antique shops and changing the road hierarchy to allow people to walk more freely along the street um, is just one example of where that can work uh, quite easily. Yes, we'll, we'll come on to talk about parking in a little bit more detail in a moment. And um, yes. Sarah, thank you very much for your question about my, my, my mic. Hopefully that's a bit louder. I'm just speaking a bit more loudly. I think I'm some of you may have noticed I'm in my office this evening, so there's still still a few people milling around doing some work. So I'm trying to be modest and not speak too loudly, but it's important that everyone can hear me. So thank you very much, Sarah, for, for highlighting that. A couple of questions we've just had had in, and, and James, Jess, Phil, perhaps we can address those now before we move on. Um, Jess, you mentioned parking there. I think we'll, we'll get into that discussion because it is important. Um, but Bernadette asks that the, the entrances to Leinster are, are a little tired or shabby and, and don't lead you into the town and high street in a positive way. 
Are you looking at the town's entrances? So James, there are a couple of things there, aren't there? One is the wayfinding point that we've already discussed about, about leading you into the town of the high street in a positive way. I think another is if you're looking at the, the slide we've got on there at the moment, the, the, little, um, the little yellow sunshiny bits that you normally see on an OS map as being a, a viewpoint. Here, that isn't what, they're, what it is. They're, they're about, um, well, there's welcome features and artwork there. There's connecting nodes there. So can you talk, talk to those a little bit more? Absolutely. And I think it's, as you say, they are nodes and they're, they're areas that we've identified as these key entrance points. And um, I'm burned out, as you say, that, you know, the, the entrance spaces in or the entrances to um, Levenster are tired. And, and ultimately, the scope of the project is, is, is prioritised in the key historic retail areas as well. So, so there's a, there's a finite amount that we can extend the scope of works um, but one thing we do know from these type of projects that they they ultimately end up as a catalyst to future works and whether those are small interventions that um, that are done through Lemonster and the community whether it be uh, Leaf and Bloom and those features that you know revitalize give everyone a, a, a fresh fresh start as it were to to see what can happen um simple tree planting maintenance and as david said that that wayfinding is is, is key sorry james um you, you've referred there to the to the funding um and another question and you know this is all very positive but how far will the budget go will there be an opportunity to apply for further funding so one of the things for me that makes this consultation process so important and certainly talking to, to trish marsh about it something that i heard her say to to many people um, when we spoke to them on Saturday, you know, two million pounds on the one hand sounds like a lot of money. On the other hand, you know, it's not an enormous amount of, of money. And so it's important that we speak to the people of Lemster to understand what their priorities are so that they can tell us, well, if you've got a limited amount of cash, these are the bits that we really want you to spend it on. And certainly we talked about trip hazards earlier, James, you know, that simply the services, the surfaces that we were standing on, on, on Corn Square, on High Street, were one of the things that people really highlighted to us. And and were immediately obvious the first time we, we visited Lemster. Um, another is the wayfinding you mentioned there. So about when, I, when I first came to Lemster, I came on the train and you know, the wayfinding from the station wasn't necessarily as good as it was when I, I went to Ludlow or went to other places. So there are other things that we can think about in the future. Um, and then the final thing I want to point out there is, um, again, conversations we've had with Lemster Town Council, with Herefordshire Council, that one of the things that we can get out of this consultation process that we're going through now, um, particularly if it's really well engaged with by Lemster, is, is a really strong sense and evidence base of, of the change and the improvements that the people of Lemster and visitors to Lemster would like to see. And getting those down and documenting them and analysing them really support future funding bids. So the question is, will there be an opportunity to apply for further funding? Absolutely, there will be. And then the more feedback we can get through this process and formalise and analyse, the stronger those, those bids and application applications for future funding will be. Bill, you're, you're probably closer to the finance the finances than, uh, than James or I are. Is there anything you'd like to add on, on, on talking about how far the budget will go and opportunities for future funding applications? Um, one thing I would mention is that two million is to cover the whole of the cost. So that needs to cover not just the cost of the works, um, but surveys, the cost of this consultation and everything as well. So they're right. Um, it isn't a, a lot of money relative to the area that is um, we're looking at, which is, as you say, David, is so important um, that we do get the feedback uh, and the, um, the information from uh, the Lempster, people in Lempster to see what their priorities are. Um, we, we won't be able to do everything on the wish list um, it's, I'm certain that some of the wishes will not be uh, complimentary anyway, um, but we will need to uh, focus in on what is the most important um, aspects, the works that need to be done uh, from the people in Leinster's point of view. Uh, there are some other uh, funding streams, we might be getting onto that later, and one of the questions that I know is coming later, um, so we maybe talk about that then. Well, Tony, why don't we, we talk about that now? So a couple of points you, you brought up there, um, and, and, but not least because I've opened up this picture and, and people can see the, the virtual model of, of Corn Square that the team of areas have created, and, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the possibilities. But before we get to that, 
And a technical point you brought up there, Phil, so the, the two million pounds is for everything. And, and you know, certainly from a consultation perspective, there are things we would like to do that we're not, we're not doing. I mean, more promotion, be around more often, but you know, every pound spent on the consultation is a pound not spent on, on physically improving Leominster from this particular pot of money. So that's why we've had to make some choices about, uh, about you know, the number of events we hold, for example. Um, and then the other point there, Phil, about the other complementary uh, pots of funding. So one of the questions that we had several times on, on Saturday was, are you going to do anything about the uh, uh, the building in the corner of, of Corn Square there, the Conservative building in the corner of Corn Square? Uh, and that's obviously not within the scope of this particular project, but Phil, that there are aligned projects which which are going to be looking at that, and you'll be finding more finding out more about that and ensuring that they align actually as part of the initiative um, very soon. Yeah, so our um, our scope, as it were, is just the public realm, um, which is the pavings and, and uh, signage, as we've discussed, and, and such like um, street furniture. Um, there is uh, at least a couple of other ones that I'm aware of. One is um, funding separate projects for putting Wi-Fi through the town, and another one looking at the um, facades of some of the heritage buildings um uh around the town center um and on wednesday in fact james and i are attending a, a sort of a walk around the town plus a meeting with herefordshire council and councillors um where we are being introduced to the, the thinking that is um current with regard to some of those uh works to to um look at improving the facades uh of those Heritage buildings, including the one, on, the one in the corner of Corn Square. That's right, and and right behind the stall we had on on Saturday, which I think was brought it into such a stark relief in, in more ways than one. Um, and I think it, it's reassuring to hear from you know a person that I've worked on lots of projects like this, and sometimes they can become very siloed, and you get work that doesn't relate to to other work. Um, but that meetings feel like not like the one you and James are, are having, and, and and I think. We can complement Herefordshire and, and Lemster as, as a really intelligent client in this case. That bringing all of those different streams together to make sure that one hand is talking to the other and that all opportunities for, um, for synergy, to use the term, um, are are identified. And again, Phil, while we're with we're speaking to you, and while we're on that subject, one of the things that came up on Saturday was about utilities and and, and the concerns that yeah we'll. we'll, we'll dig up and then replace and improve Corn Square and then five minutes later you know a utility company will come along Welsh Water will come along and, and, and dig it all up again and uh, and ruin the new work and uh, and the money that's been spent and um, that's something that you're meeting head on to ensure that you're you're liaising with utility companies to take the opportunity to make improvements um, at the time that, that you've got paving up already and then James I'll come to you to talk about how in future, when main, when when there's maintenance, you can do it in a better way than what's been done in the past. So, Phil, can you talk to us uh, initially about yeah. some of the liaison you're doing? Well, yeah, we we can't we don't have the authority directly, but Herefordshire Council are have been liaising with liaising with with Herefordshire Council. They are informing the utility companies. You may have already informed them by now of the pro, um, proposed works, um, and have told them that they need to do any planned maintenance or upgrades or anything in the areas uh, that we're looking at by the end of this year. And if they don't, they uh, will be a stop from doing any such works within a period after our completion. I think it's two years, don't hold me to that, but it's something like that before they can then go back into these spaces uh, to do any planned maintenance works. Clearly, if there's an emergency, um, that needs to be addressed. We can't stop that, but at least uh we'll um hopefully uh, make sure that there's no unnecessary works immediately after um we've put down all the pavings or whatever surfaces that we go for and if anyone's interested in those most precise um dates and details you know, they'll, they'll be finalized and, and come through in the final report of recommendations that the, that the project teams project teams make because they're important conditions to go with the the decisions that, that lemster and, and herefordshire have to make 
James, Phil alluded to, to emergencies, you know, emergencies do happen and sometimes you do have to dig up the road, but the, there are good ways of digging up the road and bad ways of digging up the road and, and you're leaning towards the good side. Absolutely. And I think this is the, the, the point that there's almost two strands to it. As, as Phil said, the planned maintenance and upgrades is something we can foresee in Herefordshire, as, as Phil said, they, they prompt it and they bring that work forward. As you say, the emergencies can't be foreseen. However, we can design ahead um, resilience into it so in terms of the technical detailing what we can do and what we often do in in public realm works are almost panelizing sections so if you think of it as a jigsaw if it's all one big open square piece of jigsaw and utilities have to come in and lift a section of it um, that can undermine other areas and I think historically that's been some of the issues that have left the streetscape as it is now with rutting and moving paving by simply detailing in what we call rigid restraints and this gets very technical and potentially boring so I won't go into too much you can almost panelize sections so that when the utilities come in to dig it up they relay a slightly larger section and it's all neat and redone correctly and that avoids uh, migrating materials technically that then becomes unstable and loose and then you would end up seeing what what there is now which is loose plot paving and, and rutting and so forth and that's because it's been dug up over the years it's not just the the vehicular access i think there was a little section just in just in here if anyone can see my mouse so, that we discussed in detail which has been dug up so many times that we finally gave up and just tarmacked it over because it kept kept subsiding and again that's the sort of thing that we can we can solve there's a, there's a couple more questions but we'll, we'll come to those and we'll just make some some progress now as i like to say in parliament um, and and james jess if you could talk us through some of these images we've got here of the, the possibilities for Corn Square. So we know that there are people who, who use it for parking now and want to continue using it for parking in, in the future. So that's not an option which is being entirely discounted. And, and we do really want to, to hear people's views on parking in Corn Square because we understand that you know, it's a bit of a Marmite issue. So it's important to hear from both sides of that argument. Um, but you feel certainly, James, there are, there are potentially better uses for, for what is a unique uh, space. Absolutely. And I think these these images and, and we discussed it on Saturday with a lot of the, the residents, they are for context. They show the, the sense of scale because even stood in Corn Square, you'd see the scale of the cars part. You can't necessarily imagine what other events. And we've always talked about the flexibility of, of Corn Square and even the, the High Street and Broad Street. And what we're indicating is actually the Corn Square, the the ability to accommodate these various events. We know that historically, Lemonster is um, a festival town. There's everything that goes on there and they already accommodate all these um, larger events. What we're showing is they can accommodate others. And importantly, they can accommodate others without stopping something else happening. And that's where the conversation about parking comes into it. Currently, it is a car park that you walk around. What we have said and what certainly I've discussed with many people on Saturdays, you can still have parking in a pedestrianised space. You just have to detail it and manage it. And that's what we're looking to do. It's that compromise, the management. And that's what we need to understand from everyone, what the priorities are. Lots of people said it'd be great to get all the cars out. But what happens if you rely on if you have limited mobility and you have to park within 20 yards of somewhere to go and pick up um, dog food or laundry or something like that, then, you know, we're not saying we move all the car parking out. Um, there's opportunity for all of these things. And a pure example, a couple of short term disabled bays or loading bays that people can move in. It's just that flexibility and the understanding of making better use of the space. And then do, obviously to working with Lemster Council and again making recommendations potentially about changing the uses of uh, spaces within very nearby car parks, like the Etnum Street car park for example, increasing the, the number of disabled spaces there. That there was one um, family we spoke to on Saturday who were there with their, their disabled elderly mother um, normally park in Corn Square, but obviously it was Farmer's Market Day on a Saturday, no parking in Corn Square, but we're able to park in the disabled space um, at the very edge of Etnam Car Park with a quick and level access into Corn Square and you know, options to potentially increase the, the number and availability of, of those type of spaces to meet that challenge. So I, I, what I want to do is to reassure everybody that there are, there are no stakeholders being forgotten or prejudiced against in, in this process and that the work James, uh, Jess and the Aries team are doing 
very much takes into account the needs of all stakeholders and then balances them and there are difficult decisions to make as those part of those recommendations. And I think it's worth noting that the, the consideration of parking and we understand, as you say, we understand that people with reduced mobility may have to park there. That's in the context of a poor streetscape where access and movement is difficult now. Um, whereas the works that we're doing will make more uh, level thresholds, better accessibility. So even parking slightly further out will still be made easier to get to a destination. And I think that's it. it's, it's the wider picture of the works and that's why it extends as, as far as it does. Um, there's that we've got images in context of performance venues and you know i think there was a couple of comments about loud music events we're not suggesting late night gigs we're talking about um events it could be an orchestra it could be you know something very subtle that fits the context um and ultimately we're not saying we're going to design for a performance venue what we want to say is we're pref we're designing that you could accommodate a performance venue or continue the markets and extend the markets um and i think that that's really what needs to be considered and and actually tell us what else it could accommodate so that we can consider these things and the markets aren't necessarily um you know a new and a new advent because there are farmers markets and friday markets there every week um, at the moment and, and seasonal markets as well but certainly again talking to some of the stallholders James on Saturday that can be better catered for than they are today you know better access and easier access to power more level uh, level land underneath them opportunities to keep them dry and stop their customers getting wet and things that can be done to make Lemster's markets more competitive when, when compared to, to the wider area um, which again will be good news for them when it comes to achieving some of those success criteria we talked about earlier and um, you've alluded to it there James these are all options they're ideas and um, there are more ideas that aren't depicted here and, and we want people to have those so you know, that sort of semi temporary covered market area was something which we discussed before we could have put onto one of these and and asked people about but that came up through the consultation so um, these are all just uh, just options um, and, and similarly with um, the cinema option that we showed earlier, and someone was saying to us, you know, how, how often do you think people want to use it as a cinema? cinema? Well, actually, it's not something that would be permanent. Again, it might just come for a weekend or, or, or a few days um, and, and, then, and then go away again. It's, that's the essence of a flexible space that can really bring a sense of change and culture and dynamism to, to a town centre like Lemster that will help families and younger people think, well, you know, that's not the same all the time. I'm not going to get excited about a farmer's market. It's there every month. If you've got a changing space, then actually you can start to get a lot more excited about it. <clears throat> and, and on consultation with the town council, one of the things that we included here was the, the ice rink and the Christmas tree. So I understand that the Christmas lights are, are switched on in Corn Square and Lemster every year, but the lights actually tend to go on almost everywhere else um, rather than in Corn Square. So actually creating a space that can really be at a celebration at those festive, festive times of year. And as we approach the the Queen's Jubilee. Um, I'm sure we'll all be getting our Union Jacks out and again an example of how our spaces can be used um, to, to, to better celebrate times like that and you know, Jubilees or, or coronations as I'm sure we'll have coming up unfortunately in the not too distant future, the sort of thing that can really be celebrated in a space like this. Jess you're nodding, is there anything you'd like to, to add to that? Um, no really I was just agreeing with exactly what you were saying and I think um, one thing that is worth stressing from my point of view is uh, there's all these pockets of community efforts that you see flashes of throughout the town. So uh, artwork on the walls, been painted by the community, and even the uh, sort of tongue-in-cheek bunting that's been put up along Butcher's Row, which is also, by the way, a lovely example of a historic passageway that's um, been well kept and well looked after. And what we're sort of um, just trying to give you uh, uh, a notion of with these images is that that kind of community spirit uh, is existing in pockets and we'd like to give you the, the platform to expand that and really show, show it off in a, in a different capacity, in a bigger capacity in the centre of the town. Jess, you talked a little bit about the arts and, and culture there. One of the questions you had is whether or not we'd consider a, a permanent public sculpture that celebrates Lemster's history. It could be used as a talking slash meeting point. Yeah, from my perspective, I think the answer is absolutely. We consider everything and that's the point of this consultation. You know, please do make those um, those recommendations and again you know when it comes to um to things like art and sculpture they don't necessarily have to come out of this pot of funding you can look at, at, at alternatives for funding stuff like that and what you would create aries is, is the space where that could 
that could happen. So yeah, absolutely. If that's something you'd like to see, um, yeah, please do. Uh, please do tell us. Um, another simple question, which is much easier to answer: Will there be any more consultation events? I was away on Saturday, and um, yes, there absolutely will be. We'll we'll be at a Friday market uh, towards the end of this month. And so, off the top of my head, we'll we'll get to it in a moment. Um, but yeah, plenty of opportunity to to come and speak to us. And, and similarly, um, everybody down at Memster Town Council is is engaged with this process, and we left some consultation materials in in the tourist office there. So please do pop in and have a conversation. You know, there's a telephone number you can give us a ring on if you want to to talk about the project. Um, certainly, Julie, Liz, Town Council, um, when they're around, we'll, we'll be able to answer answer questions and then forward questions to us where they can't. So um, this is an ongoing consultation for the next six weeks, finishing on the 21st of June. Um, we'll be around again on, on the 27th. Um, but also, uh, we're hoping that, I think there's a special market for the Jubilee weekend and that there'll be a presence there as well. Um, getting on to we've mentioned parking but you know, James Jess it, it does worth it is worth um, talking about I found myself saying regularly um, to people on Saturday that when we were talking about the corn square spaces there are only 23 spaces in corn square there are 575 parking spaces across the the main main car park so even only reducing that to um, to, to 552 is that right it doesn't change the world necessarily um, but it's still a very emotive issue and, and what you've done here is break break the centre of Lemster down using um, not ISO bars, the ISO bars, um, with with distances on them to, to demonstrate actually how many parking spaces there are within 100 metres, 200 metres, 300 metres of the uh, of of Corn Square of of the town centre. So there are lots of options, and, and highlighted here also some of the uh, on street parking and there's, there's free on street parking that's that's available as well. So it's not a case of only paying. Um, James, Jess, is there anything you want to add on the parking point? Because I think it is worth um, uh, worth dwelling on for a minute. We know it's very important to people that, that visit Lemster often. It is, and, and as you said, as you alluded to, you know, it, it came up a lot at the consultation on Saturday. Um, it just shows it in context, and and it, it brings me back to the point I made recently, where you know it's a well used parking space because it's in the centre. It's not because it's well accessible. It's actually a very difficult car park to drive to and get a space. And I think talking to a lot of residents, you understand that they they walk through and they say, well, I saw someone drive around four times waiting for a space and then they sat there for 20 minutes. So, you know, there's there's a kind of understanding that actually it isn't necessarily the best space place to park. Um, and, and just showing context, and I think the map shows that, as you said, it's you know five minute walk and and, and so forth. And remember that we the intervention to the wider public realm will make it easily or much more easily accessible um, for all, all visitors. And, and we appreciate that it's not necessarily a five minute walk for everybody, um, but certainly you know, a five minute walk for for some people. So there are, there are a number of options. And and um, James, you mentioned the. The, the, the queuing for parking spaces in Corn Square and then the waiting and, 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 and that idling, as it's known, it's, it's really bad for fumes, it's bad for, uh, for pollution and, and the whole environment in Corn Square of, of you know, people that are sitting outside coffee number one and um, not actually being able to relax and, and enjoy their time there because they've got you know, one car coming in, one car coming out, you know, three, cars, three cars waiting. Uh, that means that, that isn't necessarily a really nice place to sit, unlike when we were there um, in the sunshine with no cars around on, on a Saturday when there were many people sitting there for, for sustained periods and enjoying their time there. Um, just talking about the, obviously comparing a, a sunny Lemster to, to Lemster at other times, um, Bernadette asks, have you visited Lemster in the evenings? We, we, we have, and certainly in the winter months, those evenings drew in and, and arrived a lot earlier. It's a very different experience to a sunny day. Beautiful and innovative street lighting could really help make it a more inviting place to be in the evenings perhaps linking the Priory to Corn Square. And Jess, immediately a, a nod from you there, and you've talked about the alleyways a little bit, but, but street lighting is something that you're thinking about as part of this project, isn't it? Yes, yeah, certainly. Lighting is quite an important one, a very important one. Um, so for linking spaces together, and it will it sort of goes hand in hand with the wayfinding strategy, but also to, to it links with the safety point, is so secure by design and ensuring that the spaces that aren't presently that well street lit are so going forward. So it feels like a, a safer environment to, to be in at nighttime. Um, and there's also uh, creative uses 
lighting that you can uh, use for historic assets, to use a warmer lighting, for example, to, to make them look beautiful in the evening, as well as the more functional side, so uh, best lighting, walking routes, um, etc. Uh, et so yeah, it's certainly something that is uh, very important and we are considering. Thanks, Jess. And um, another comment's come in from Rob Holder. We were talking about that point around the the different funds uh, and the different, you know, how the how the money can be used. Uh, Rob points out all the, all the information is available at um, www.historicengland.org.uk. You can find out all about the the high street has uh, and specifically the Lemster High Street has and what that means for for investment here. Um, it isn't just Lemster that, that we're, we're asking people questions about because we know that people that live in Lemster or visit Lemster also visit other places. So the reason that we've got this slide up is the questionnaire does try to understand more information about why people go to Lemster and what they do it for and how often and how that compares to visits to Worcester or Hereford or Ludlow um, or, or other um, villages within a, within a five mile radius of Lemster again. And, and that information, thank you so much in advance all of you who have joined us today taking the opportunity to, to fill that questionnaire out really helps us understand uh, the recommendations about how Leinster can compete with those other places and will inform um, future applications for funding as well and um, so I want to talk about next steps for a moment and um, we did have that one question earlier around uh, the uh, the consultation events and when we're next going to be around and we're able to be there on Saturday so we will be there at market day uh, on Friday the 27th of May. We've got this webinar today, Monday the 16th of May, as I've said right at the beginning and, and bears repeating now, this is being recorded. It'll be uploaded to the website. So anybody that's that's missed today who you know, please do tell them and they can review it on the website and we'll, consultation will be open until the 21st of June. Uh, through, the su through, through the summer, we'll be considering all the feedback that we receive as part of this consultation uh, and feeding that into the ARIES team to help develop your, your final proposals and recommendation before we finally and publish the final design in, in the late summer, early autumn. And then, Bill, you'll be getting your spade out um, come the beginning of, of next year. Um, next year, we hope, with a view to completing uh, in late 2023. Uh, correct, yes. The um, funding requirements say that it has all got to be finished and wrapped up by the end of March 2024, but we don't want to push it too close to the, uh, to the wire. Uh, and we don't think we need to at the moment. Um, the the um, uh, design following the public consultation uh, will proceed through this summer. There'll also be um, consideration um, for another uh, opportunity for um, people to comment on the sort of final designs or proposed designs. Uh, and, um, uh, and then that, those will be finalised. They all need all to be ratified and, and signed off by um, uh, Heritage England by Lemster Town Council and by Herefordshire Council, which won't be a, a quick process in, in itself. Um, we'll be looking to um, uh, engage a contractor later this year um, with a view to starting um, spring next year, 2023, uh, and hopefully our well, intention is to be complete before Christmas next year. And then that gives us that just bit of buffer between then and the end of March um, for unforeseen delays or hiccups or what have you. But uh, if everything goes well, we'll be out of Leominster um, before Christmas next year. Great, thanks Phil, just in time. What, what a Christmas present that will be. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my, my screen there. <clears throat> and James, just while we wait for, um, please do, you know, we've still got lots of people um, watching the webinar in the room, so to speak. So please, if you have any further questions, now's the time, type them into that Q&A and, and I'll put them to the team. But James, just while we're waiting for that, one of the things that came up quite a lot on Saturday was about greenery. So only the two trees in, um, in Corn Square at the moment and, and some sort of flowers and planters outside the tourist office, but certainly not uniform. Some people like planters, some people don't. To, to what extent have you got a view on, on planting trees and, and, and flowers and the opportunities there? Not just in Corn Square, again, we should emphasise throughout the town centre. It is a very significant um, consideration. And, and as you said, we were kind of questioned, well, why haven't you got any trees and plants and the visuals? And I think ultimately, um, as I said, it's kind of scale for those proposals. There is certainly an intention, and as designers and landscape architects, it is um, deep within our our hearts, you know, if, if not to be too too soft, that 
to pull in new habitat and planting and all the benefits of urban cooling and air pollution, everything that it does. And we all, ultimately we use planting as a design tool to start to create spaces, define smaller spaces and thresholds. So they will be elements that will tease into the design and as the design develops you'll start seeing them coming in um, ultimately we'd love to hear your thoughts on it and if there's any particular areas at the same time we're, we've talked a lot about flexibility of spaces um, there is always a discussion point about having trees and planting in planters that ultimately restrict the longevity and the the ultimate maturity of, of trees for instance so we always try and avoid that where possible, but there's always a balance. And if a particular area would, would benefit hugely from planting, we, we look at the detail and the design and our specialist knowledge of species that might thrive in smaller areas. So it's, it's this toolbox where the right, right plant, right place, and that's really something that undermines all of it. So they will come through. Thank you, and again, you know, if you've got a big tree planted in the ground, then that's not something that can be moved for a flexible space, so that needs to be taken into account. Phil, you've got your hand up. Yes, yeah, so I was noticing earlier today that in the um, invitation to tender that we received from Herefordshire Council, they gave a list of overarching objectives, and the first one of those was sustain and enhance biodiversity and air quality improvements for the well-being of all who come to enjoy Lemster, which I think ties in nicely with what uh, James was just saying. Yes, and yeah, and certainly air quality can be improved, but yeah. removing things as well as, as adding new things. But, Absolutely. Um, okay, so another question there, James, we've, we've discussed this before at length. Uh, just to, to be clear, you know, we had him sent to us before we started, but what sort of measures can make access to the town centre easier for those uh, many people who use walking frames, mobility buggies, wheelchairs, or, or, or push children in buggies? Um, and that's some of the trip hazards that you were talking about before and, and some of the sort of easier, more obvious wins that can be made by levelling things out, making wayfinding clearer and, and, and stopping those trips and falls that, that we witnessed ourselves even just there for a few hours. Absolutely. And I think you, you, you touched on it there that there's there's very ultimately basic design and technical detail and that we we know uh, best practice in terms of if you were to design if there had to be a, an upstand or a curb it is set to a certain height so it isn't um, misperceived as a, a shadow or just a slight lane uh, change in level there's paving failings that ultimately are quite a significant um, reason for why there are trips and and, and falls and you know uh, limits to accessibility through the town now so these all uh, everything that we do in terms of just making making good the the damage but also designing for as you say um the flush uh level thresholds um we know that there's very narrow footpaths particularly down down high street and and on one hand we're we're kind of promoting the ability for shops to to expand out into that public realm there is a finite space and it, it's that discussion about um, priority of streets so there are some interventions and, and some towns do it very successfully where you take away those curbs and you have a, um, a level threshold that that promotes that interaction between vehicle users and pedestrians if that is something that's developed there's always uh, options and conversations about removing cars out of out of the streets whether that's through uh, time limitations through traffic regulation orders which is something we we we're very used to do when we have specialists on the design team to um, to lead on those conversations. Obviously, that has big knock on effects in terms of accessibility, physically getting to various parts of the town. It's not a not a straightforward proposition just to remove cars out of, for instance, High Street. It's it's something that has to be considered uh, with all implications. But there's lots of possibilities. Can you just do a little bit more on, on that point you've made there, James, talking about in the context of, of delivery? So certainly, and we spoke to people that talked specifically about weather spoons and, and the deliveries that go to weather spoons and there are alternatives potentially to service weather spoons from the rear rather than the front and that you can do lots of work to corn square but then as soon as you chuck a few really large wagons around it a few times a week for a few months then some of your, your good work immediately is, is inevitably ruined so can you just talk a little bit about what can be done deliveries to businesses you know, especially absolutely a really small number got no access um, other than other than uh, through the historic part absolutely Pardon me, James, I've muted you there by mistake. That's on me. So if you could unmute yourself. That's okay. 
I'll take the hint. Um, I think ultimately for businesses, and it is something that we we understand and through um, the engagement and through other similar projects, um, deliveries and ultimately the boring bits are key to those businesses making a living and sustaining their presence there. So we have to afford it. Um, and we do that through proper design and understanding and designing sub bases that, you know, the, the substructure below the paving to accommodate those large vehicles. Um, and then there's also the, the kind of parallel discussions with the businesses to see if there is any alternative, as you said, deliveries around the back of premises, which are less, um, less public realm, you know, which, because there's the physical presence of these very large vehicles. They may only be there for half an hour, but if they're there every two days, uh, it's the same as refuge collection. It's those conversations with businesses and is there an opportunity, um, pure example, because it's another project I've done similarly where um, businesses almost club together and, and align all their refuge collections. So it's possibly more frequent, but smaller amounts or less frequent and, and all planned in one. So it's, is that joined up thinking as you said we know lemonster are very forward thinking in this um this type of thing in terms of the projects but as well as that so yeah I'll just give different everyone, avenues i'll give everyone the two minute warning there for, for any further questions and we've, we've had a, a couple more in which we'll we'll address and, and if there aren't any more then we'll conclude so i can see some people clearly had appointments on the hour at seven and they've had to start um, start departing. You talked about joined up thinking there, James. So one of the questions we had, is there a potential clash between uh, the Heritage Action Zone funding, public realm funding, for example, restoring shops and repairing pavements? And Bill, James, this is one of the things that you'll be looking to address with your, your visit on Wednesday and, and, and other conversations you're having to make sure that, that there are synergies and no clashes. Yeah, I mean, the, the public realm works are part of the high street Heritage Action Zone funding stream. So um, it, it is the, the, what we're doing is part of that, is funded by, by that um, funding stream. Um, but yes, it is vitally important that what we do doesn't clash and, and um, undermine anything else that's going on in the town, um, which is partly the purpose of, of the meeting on Wednesday. Um, and it's not only in what is happening, but when it's happening as well, um, because we don't want any of the frontage works now also to be um, digging up or, or changing the pavings immediately in front of them or anything like that. So, yes, it does need to be coordinated um, and that, that is in hand. I should say that I'm sure there are vast majority of people that are that are watching and listening to us now are probably watching it after Wednesday the 18th of May so that meeting will of course already happen and oh, yes. um and, and you'll be meeting us um potentially you know in in Leinster on, on the 27th or or, or yes. engaging with our questionnaire but the idea the main point is to be reassured that the uh, one hand is talking to the other and, and looking for opportunities to, to complement and not compete I think it's also, sorry, David, just to add, it is worth noting that the, the funding pots are secured against each work. So the public realm um, pot of money, for instance, wouldn't be used on um, frontages and vice versa. So they are, they're separately secured, which I don't know if that was part of that question. As well, yes, I think. I think it probably is worth saying that two million quid is we're talking about the public realm side and not being used for the frontages. And there are different amounts attached to those that, those pots of money. That's That's important, even though the fund might appear to be the same. Only the one question left, and probably appropriate that we finish on parking, because we know that it is it, it's very important to um, to the visitors of Lemster, and we we drove as well to Lemster and had to park on on Saturday, and, and, and every time I've been, apart from when I got the train actually. Um, Ludlow parking allows you 15 minutes free parking. It's so handy without encouraging lots of cars into Lemster. Could a plan like that be considered? And, and what, what I'll add, and James, um, Jess, I'll ask you to, to build on that is we are not recommending a thinking about a removal of all free parking in Leinster, far from it. You know, when we think about Corn Square, it's, it's just potentially those 23 spaces and maybe not even all of those spaces at, at all times. Um, so it, it's not a case of, of getting rid of, of free parking altogether. And also there are other options that we've, we've discussed and can be examined about you know, looking at schemes, working with local businesses where you can get tickets validated so that you can pay to park if, if you don't shop locally, but if you do shop locally, then, then you don't have to pay to park and that money's reimbursed. So there are other options that can be examined within the recommendations. Um, a final point on parking, James, Jess, Phil? I think it's, as, as, as you alluded to, it's, it's why, we're, why we're consulting as well. We want to understand 
the the criteria there because as you said on Saturday there was a very strong feeling that cars should be removed from the space and actually the Saturday and Friday markets were a great precedent for how the town works without parking in Corn Square it's the, you know it, it's the possibly the, the busiest and most bustling times of the week and that's without parking there so I think there's as I said there's great precedent for it and you know we can look at that and and it is flexibility it's looking at how it, it can be balanced and there's ways you can do it through as i said traffic regulation orders or or physical uh, management of stopping vehicles into a certain area for particular times of the day or or days of the week it's not an all or nothing scenario i think is the is the key yes and that's, yeah. I mean, that's the case already jess Exactly. And I think understanding your need for parking will just help support those changes that do need to be made in terms of what of the existing provision and what's free and to what extent and what other schemes are put in place. So it's important to hear your feedback on exactly what, what you feel is needed from a parking perspective. Um, and I guess the other benefit of having of um, better utilising the existing car parks around town centres that draws people into the centre of the town. Um, so it almost forces people to see more of the town than they perhaps might not see if they had just buzzed into Corn Square, stayed in that area and left again. So there is there are other less less easy to see and less tangible benefits of, of um, moving parking or better utilising the existing car parks than just parking. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Jess. And what I wasn't able to make as articulately as I would have liked on, on Saturday, and I certainly will do when I return on the Friday, is that not parking at exactly your destination really supports the economy of the town by making sure that you, you can you pass other businesses maybe more than one rather than going directly to the point that you want to want to go to getting back in your car and, and going home again again i'm not i'm not the bbc but i should say for balance the other side of the argument was put forward to us as well and, and traders who felt strongly that um that, that, that getting rid of parking would, would be a, a real problem for the, for the future success of leinster so we are hearing arguments on both sides uh, and then we'll only be making recommendations um, off the back of, of all of our consultation and ultimately it's down to Talented Town Council and, and Herefordshire Council to take all of that into account. The consultation, um, James and, and Jess and Phil's professional recommendations uh, and then to take a decision about the best way forward. So that's it, we did run a little bit over. Thank you so much if you've, if you've made it this far as I can see many of you have done and, and a couple of people I've had the pleasure of speaking to in the past as well. So thank you so much for your time. Um, if you're watching the recording, thank you very much also for your time and, and for, for getting this far. And I hope that you found this interesting. Please, please do go to um, to, to Herefordshire's website and answer the questionnaire. It'll only take you five to five to ten minutes. And the easiest way of finding it, just Google Lemster consultation. It comes up right at the top of the search. Um, thank you very much to our, our colleagues at, at Herefordshire Council for the hard work that they've done on that as well. Uh, so you know, thank you to the project team this evening, Phil, James, Jess, Alice. Thank you so much for your, your time on, on a Monday evening. Um, hopefully everybody has found it really interesting and valuable. Uh, and the conversation continues. Consultation open until the 21st of June. And next opportunity to meet us in person on Friday, the 27th of May. And, and it's a project I'm really enjoying working on. So I look forward to, to continue to have the conversation over the next month or so. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.